the history and the present are all intermingled into one. We know for a fact that laborers and enslaved people um, pre-emancipation were living in these cabins, but we also know they were used as guest houses in more recent times. And then in some cases they were used as trash dumps in even more recent times. So we get all of that trash and material sort of mixed in together. And the beauty of it is that it allows us to sort of look around and analyze the entire spectrum of life on the estate. In the 1800s, enslaved Africans were brought into the ports of Christiansted on the Caribbean island of St. Croix. About 140 enslaved people were forced to work on a state little princess, a sugar plantation and rum factory. The project of the Estate Little Princess really began as a terrestrial archaeology component to a slave wrecks project. And the idea was that we would have a terrestrial archaeology site and a maritime archaeology site that could both speak to the slave trade um, from different perspectives. While the terrestrial archaeology has been forthcoming, we haven't been so forthcoming in terms of locating a, a shipwreck to tell that sort of maritime perspective. Overall, it's been good because it's been providing new information and new insight in two ways that maritime resources are actually used on terrestrial landscapes. So aspects such as coral mining uh, that was used for housing construction, and then also some of the shellfish and widened fish, of course, that were used as provisions on the island. Still trying to understand how this landscape has changed over time is one of my main uh, questions. The island itself is borderline on its ability to provide enough water for that many plantations. Europeans who came here along with others, removed a lot of the surface vegetation so that they could clear spaces to cultivate sugar. When all of those trees are removed, then the natural soil deposition and also water regimes are changed across the entire island. Those kind of changes are visible on the landscape even still, because even though there's not sugar widespread cultivation on island, it's changed the possible plants that could actually live there. It really allows us to think about how enslaved Africans were using plant material. Um, and that's important because in the archaeological record, a lot of those uh, don't, don't appear, uh, mainly because they go away. But if we have access to the plants that are still growing today, we can begin to think about how these plants may have been used by historic populations in the past. Fewer people are talking about actually environmental reparations. And what does it look like when we talk about reparations in a context that has been completely decimated by the slave trade and by slavery? We're looking at increased soil erosion as a result of these clear cutting of forests. We're looking at increased wave turbidity at the destruction of these coral reefs. And that's something that doesn't just grow back over 10, 20, or even 50 years. In addition to surveying the environment, researchers are speaking with the community and using historical records to better understand the occupation of enslaved people on a state little princess. We don't have a 100% clear understanding of the full range of occupation. We know that the first parcel that became a state little princess was purchased in 1749, and that it was only 11 or 13 acres. Right now it's more than 30 acres. So those maps show that up to 30 cabins existed in the area where we're excavating. Of course, we've only found the remains of four. By the 60s, there was a really sustained effort for individuals to stop living in those cabins unless they were working for the property owner. From our perspective today, it seems improbable or illogical to stay in the place where slavery was taking place. But for folks who were freed, they didn't have a whole lot of options. There weren't guarantees that if they left St. Croix, they were gonna find a better life somewhere else. Focusing in on the humanity of the enslaved people is central to their research goals. There's a way that people are obsessed um, that scholars have become obsessed with numbers. And if we could pinpoint the exact amount of people that came from this place, this place, or this place, if we had the exact amount of glass, of ceramic, of fauna, if we could compile these in these databases and it can give us this greater image of what enslaved life was like. But ultimately, if we're just talking about things and we actually miss the human aspect of it, it can be really dangerous. So thinking about agency is this way of ensuring that we're talking about humans and that we're thinking about various levels of agency, all under the umbrella of enslavement. So very complex 
questions and explorations, but certainly worth diving into to really say out loud that although these people were enslaved, that they actually moved through this world and made choices under that regime about how they lived their lives, about how they built community with each other, about how they loved themselves and others. The artifacts on St. Croix help tell these stories of agency and resilience. We recovered a perforated shell here at the site, and we've recovered a number of smaller finds that could have been used in dormant practices like glass beads, bone buttons, ceramic buttons, hook and eye fasteners, so these small finds that speak to these larger dynamics of dress at the site. The fact that we're finding not just porcelain, but hand-painted porcelain at a State Little Princess tells something about access and agency and the movement of goods between communities on this island. So even though they're living inland, they're nowhere near the town, they're able to participate in the economy in a different way than we might have thought of before. They are not just there waiting for, you know, someone to break something so they can get a hand-me-down. They are actively procuring their own wares. As a purification, they would have a limestone block and they'd you know, perch that somewhere. And the limestone block has properties that is a natural purifier. So they literally run water through the stone and then it would drip through the limestone into a large storage vessel, the African ware. So they're taking that same pottery, but they're literally creating a system to purify their own water because they have been blocked from access to cisterns from the, that the Europeans are mainly using. And they are relegated to using these free guts that are highly contaminated because everyone's using it for water, for cleaning, for livestock, for bathing, for <laughs> any, any purpose you can imagine. They came up with a way to solve that themselves. We're really interested in really understanding what they went through, what they survived, what they, what they see as their expression, their identity, their, their culture, and their community, beyond just looking at the artifacts, beyond just looking at that status of being enslaved. We want to be able to tell the most complete story we can with the bits of pieces that we have to tell that.